Okay, okay, good. Welcome back everyone. We're getting started again with this lecture with an overview on the technologies that are around. And I thought I start off with telling you how amazing this time is, I think, that we live in, so that we can actually see magic become reality. The magic that we read in our childhood novels about, in the Harry Potter novels, in the Night Circus, and many others, that have become technologically feasible. We can actually build illusions, if you want, that work so well that we can mistake them for reality. And before I tell you more about the underlying technologies that are around, I thought I'll bring you a few examples of these technologies. For example, shape-shifting. Shape-shifting is pretty much possible with technologies like these, and it's widely in use, as you may have noticed with your Snapchat and other applications that you see here on the left, um, or a bit more advanced technologies from the avatar creator, uh, the same people that are behind the application we use for the 3D scanning. It's quite eerie at times, but given that this took me only a few seconds to set up with a single photograph of mine on the right um, that is quite amazing or rather not so amazing if I look at it now and it becomes worse trust me on that it becomes worse yeah not even sure I want to show you that yeah so these technologies have been around for a while this one here so that's morphing technology when I was 17 I wrote my school final year thesis about morphing and mathematical algorithms that pretty much did exactly the same thing and were in use in the film industry at that point in time. Industrial Light and Magic made Willow and Terminator 3 and so on. And um, I think mathematically the algorithms uh, in the core have not changed a lot. Um, it's just our use of them that has certainly advanced. Another favorite uh, magic of mine is levitation. It's quite amazing if you can make things levitate with the control of your fingers. Uh, here an example using a special sensor, the Leap Motion, which is that little device that you see somewhere there in front of uh, the person operating. And um, just using it to pipe the data through to a drone so you can fly uh, an, an object uh, with the control of your fingertips. Or here, um, <coughs> controlling somebody else's movement uh, is uh, a 3D scan of mine and uh, showing off some amazing dancing skills that I have willed into my own body. <coughs> it is um, quite amazing what we can do with today's technology and if we set things up right, then uh, they actually work and we, uh, we commit to that illusion. So, what is the technology that I'm talking about and how have I structured this talk. I will tell you a little bit about kind of the end user level, um, which I'm mentioning for here as we also have some people from the art school present and it may be an easy way of creating very quickly some prototype applications. Um, it I will also take us all um, to the lower level where we look at SDKs and then even a level lower where we look at individual technology components, in particular delivery systems and sensors. So let's stick with the first and look at AR browsers and reality editors. One of the first AR browsers around is certainly Argon, um, and that's also an SDK that has uh, spin off from Argon. Argon is an augmented reality browser that tries to use open technologies, in particular web technologies, and that allows users to point um, their browser at a web URL which contains all the data in HTML and uh, associated JavaScript that is required to actually render an augmented reality application. Um, in the example here, to make something appear or in the example here um, to the right, working with surfaces and objects and markers and so on. We'll come to that a little bit later, but from the user perspective, the takeaway message here is that browsers for augmented reality allow you to consume AR applications in a standardized way. They have come a long way, but they are not yet there so that augmented reality has uh, made its way into the 
common set of core technologies uh, that the web dictates to us or that we well dictate is a strong word that uh, we develop in a huge community of developers scholars around the globe but there is movement in the field and I'm very excited about that <coughs> Editors was the second word I used in combination with browser, and I've brought you one example here, Wikitude, which has also been around for quite a while, and um, has been going through multiple iterations um, in, in the development, is a very powerful community today with over 125,000 registered developers and uh, quite a number of very active developers amongst them and allows you to do things like like this. So you can use a marker, in that case a prospectus, and then um, quite simply superimpose things by drag and dropping the elements on the screen around as you as you see fit for them. That can then be tested until you're happy with the results and can then be released to the public so people who have access um, to a Wikitude browser can actually have that augmented reality experience um, that you see here in front of you. And I think making that example that you see here on the screen takes equally long as it took us now to watch. So um, they are quite simple, but they're also then quite limited in what you can actually do with them. So, of course, they do allow for very simple overlays, um, like video, like images, like 3D objects, or prepared 3D animations. But um, once you have to deal with some more complicated interaction that you want to make happen, that is not your weapon of choice. Um, there are other browsers out there. Here is a fantastic example uh, from CN2. <coughs> and the difference I see there to uh, Wikitude is CN2 is much more industrial oriented and it's much more oriented towards um, doing activities with um, in your augmented reality experience. So f imagine you had a uh, water cooler, I think this is, um, that needed some maintenance operation or some repair, <coughs> then you could bring up the CN2 application to play the experience for you, as you see here on the screen. So uh, it has very accurate overlay of um, the 3D model fitted to the actual object. In that case, it works with the video see-through. They also have some cool smart glasses applications. And I particularly like the way they deal with the user interface and make sure that the user has the best possible experience by distributing the labels in a convenient way by placing the important elements fixed on the screen and allowing people to step through um, each of the action steps that they need. So CN2 is um, in the US and it's one of um, several companies that are very advanced but they also have um, in their team quite an academic background. Um, Alex came originally from Blair McIntyre, who is behind Argon, the browser. So this is um, how the field unfolds. And you can really see how some things that were concocted up in universities make their way into industry. Yeah. Another example that I brought from our own work is um, a different type of editor and browser. It is one that uses uh, the in situ HoloLens smart glasses experience for a trainer to create a recording of what they want to show to a trainee. And is also similar to the CN2 browser uh, activity oriented. And uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll show you a little bit what it does. You will see now um, a live recording that I did uh, with some completely made up activities. Don't mistake this for real if you ever would try to do that to your airplane. That's probably a very bad idea, but I think you can get the picture of um, what's possible with such an editor. So imagine I was a real expert in that case. 
and would create a recording of an activity. So I create an action point, a task station. I select one of the possible overlays. In that case, it's a, a ghost recording. I'm explaining something. Um, even if you could understand it, it doesn't make any sense, really. Um, I'm moving my hands around. Then I will add a second task station um, with a different type of annotation. In that case, it is a label that just says here. And um, in the remainder of the video, you will see how I add then um, a few additional elements, like um, an audio recording explaining what you should do with that point where you can read here, and then some video recordings, and so on and so on. So, of course, this is a completely made-up activity on a real airplane, however, and um, our partners um, in the airplane industry use this um, in, in our trials to test how well it really works to train people with these technologies, and it works surprisingly well. Yeah, the background noise that you hear from the video is someone sanding a wingspan of, of a plane. There's a lot of maintenance work being done on this ambulance uh, airplane. But yeah, I think you get the gist of what I'm telling you. So, um, but let me show you what this uh, rather quirky recording that uh, an expert did um, looks like to a trainee. As the trainee, you will see a different representation, which is much more slick, much more hands-free uh, as well, um, and uh, with a bit more guidance. So let's just bring up that recording. So I'm switching over now to the player application, loading the activity that was just created. Um, there's some navigational guidance on the floor. When you look around you, you can see kind of an aura that points you in the right direction, and the crisscrossed line shows where the first action step will take place. And when you start activity, sometimes voice commands aren't really picked up in a noisy environment like that, and you may have to use the hands. You can see the ghost recording that I had just created with some BS activity that I made completely up and do not recommend to do to any airplane. Yeah, so that's the first step, uh, jumping now through to the second task station. You remember the yellow blob? That is what this is. We can see the label here now, and we can hear the voice that was recorded with it. And in a further action step, there is then a video recording and that locate icon that looks a little bit different here now in the representation and so on and so on. So, um, there are many different browsers out there. I'm mentioning just a few more that I, I really like and recommend to play around with. We've already seen Argon, which is web technology. We've already seen Wikitude, which is one of the uh, most advanced editors that I know. We've seen Wikit uh, One, which is uh, the only, to my knowledge, in situ authoring tool for um, HoloLens training activities. There's also uh, Hewlett Packard's Reveal, which was formerly called Orasma. They call the uh, activities that you create Auras. And um, there's the Blip Builder from Blipar, who just before Christmas almost went bankrupt, but were then magically saved by an investor. Um, similarly, Blipar owns a second product that they taken over in 2009, Layar, which is particularly famous with glossy magazine content to overlay. And um, Dacry has the 4D Studio. Who knows, Apple might have something since they bought a fancy um, browser plus authoring environment uh, from a company based in Munich um, called Mitayo. When they took over Mitayo, they shelved the product. Um, and who knows, are working on something very secret at the moment, but I'm sure they're working on something. Yeah, browsers. Those were browsers. That is kind of the end user level of things. Some of them are more user friendly, some of them less. Um, typically, the more functionality you have, uh, the more difficult they are, of course, to learn and uh, to use the functionality. And I'm sure over the years uh, to come, 
also these uh, off-the-shelf products will become even more powerful than they already are. But it's, it's possible to create very quickly some content and I've seen um, all of these in action live with real content from arts galleries to industrial training applications to fun stuff people do. AR SDKs, um, the software development kits, there are quite a number of SDKs around. Most of them are used with Unity. So we're now the level lower. We're now basically on the application uh, development side. No longer an off-the-shelf product. And um, typically one would take a solution that works with all the uh, augmented reality bits and bobs meaning that enables the tracking, that enables the tracking of markers, that maybe enables the tracking of 3D objects, that uh, possibly allows also to uh, detect um, simultaneous localization and mapping, that maybe has some environmental mapping. Um, the big ones that are currently around are Vuforia and Wikitude. There's also quite new in the market AR Kit, uh, the Apple SDK, and AR Core, the Google SDK, which has then uh, different uh, bindings available as well. So it runs on multiple platforms. Um, there are also some s other ones that I'm not so familiar with, like Kudan, and uh, that is a very long list. So there are a lot, lot, lot more of those. Uh, the most popular one at the moment for market-based stuff is Buforia. They are all different in respect to which platforms they support. They are all different with respect to what uh, maximum distance to a marker they support, um, what uh, size of markers they support, and, um, and so on. I think that's on the next slide a little bit more visible. Here also with some additional ones, Maxest is the toolkit, I believe, from a South Korean company that is close to SK Telecom. Um, AR toolkit has been around for a very long time, as we've seen in the history yesterday, and um, has been taken over by Dacri um, to drive development further, and there are a number of others. There's also the Fraunhofer um, toolkit, which is not listed here. There is also Alvar from our project partner VTT in Finland, and numerous others. It depends really on the purpose you use these tracking technologies for. If you are kind of generic use, you're probably uh, well off with some of the popular alternatives, like Vuforia, Wikitude, ARKit, ARCore. <coughs> in um, case of more specialist applications where you need to do metric measurements, for example, or need to um, label ants and track a million ants in an anthill to see what their movement paths are, then you probably would want to pick something more specialist. And people do. This is a real-life example how somebody advertised their tracking product to me um, uh, a few years back that they have actually used that, that tracking toolkit to label ants and track them. A special note besides these mobile platform oriented SDKs and um, web desktop oriented SDKs is certainly web AR, augmented reality on the web. If we look there a little bit at the history of things, 2009 Blair started working on Argon, from which then Argon.js was born. 2014, Konrad uh, Zwinnel published the AR JavaScript face tracking demo, which is quite popular and make quite a kerfuffle. Um, recently, 2017, Jerome released AR.js, which is a very simple, comfortable solution, also working with the um, Google um, AR uh, core and Mozilla's A-frames to bring augmented reality to the web. And I've brought you a small example of what that actually looks like. This here is on a 
two years old phone with 60 frames per second um, using some simple animations. I think we'll do a few more complicated ones in our tutorial on animating our, your body scans. But it demonstrates that with a few lines of essentially HTML and JavaScript, you can actually create an augmented reality experience on any um, mobile phone. So here is an example of what that looks like. So that's not exactly the example you've seen in the film. So this one here is only showing a black uh, box over uh, the same marker that we've seen in the video. But that is quite slim and elegant, if you think about it. And there's certainly, um, certainly uh, some beauty in it. Blair is working at the moment uh, for the Mozilla Foundation on something very exciting. So I thought um, I'll also remind us of the underlying framework that argon.js uh, is working with. Argon.js um, distinguishes between the reality manager, which serves a reality view to the requesting client, who then works with the augmenters to overlay stuff and create things. The difference being, and that's I think the very smart thing about this architecture, it's rather capability oriented. So the reality views requested from the client say, give me a view that has a camera that points to the user, give me a view that has sound and, and that sort of stuff. And then it's up to basically the reality manager to sort out what the what sort of environment the experience actually requires. SDKs are also many. The one that we work with here in the tutorials mostly will be the mixed reality toolkit. And that's Microsoft's um, open source toolkit that you find on GitHub. And I think I already provided pointers to you how to download and um, which version of Unity it best works with. Don't make the mistake to believe that le the latest is the greatest. Um, things are moving with slower speed and uh, especially for the Mixed Reality Toolkit, the version 2017.4, the long-term support is the one that we want to work with. <coughs> yeah. Um, I don't want to go too much into detail about this, um, but there is a lot of smartness in the Mixed Reality Toolkit, and it works with a couple of the other components that we will see here for animations, for example, or for markers. Um, and I think we will have enough time to, to dwell deeper here and experience the Mixed Reality Toolkit with the dedication it deserves, because it's a fantastic project. Yeah. I think Microsoft really has the lead on uh, mixed reality and augmented reality on smart glasses at the moment, uh, challenged in a, in a good way by other competitors. But it certainly moved things quite a bit forward, and I hope it will in the future as well. So enough with the advertisement. I'm not getting paid by Microsoft, but I really like the product. I really do like the product. Yeah, and um, having said that, um, it's a nice product, but I'm sure we can build better ones. <laughs> um, let me tell you a little bit more about um, components. If you ever decided to go a level deeper and uh, wanted to work with specific um, sensors, specific additional software toolkits um, that make your life easier in, in certain respects and more painful in others. I will take you a little bit um, through hardware and software components, or software components, I think, uh, that falls again in two classes. On the one hand side, you have the libraries that execute something at runtime for your users when they have an augmented reality experience. On the other hand side, there are production tools, software packages that help you create something like an animation that uh, the end user will never see. Amongst the hardware components, um, there's a lot to be said about um, chipsets and accelerators for specific jobs. And there's also a lot of movement in the, in the hardware market. 
Um, NVIDIA is a company that is uh, particularly um, great with respect to graphics and the work they do on standardization around that. Um, yeah, but there are um, other relevant uh, things that we don't have time for today, but may have time in a successor course for this one, um, hopefully coming out uh, soon. What I will tell you more about are the different types of display systems, so that you have a good set of things that you know exist and that you can work with. I will not uh, lose much time speaking about optics and subcomponents, but um, if you ever want to uh, pester someone with really difficult questions, then Will is your guy. <laughs> will used to work for an optics company and has quite profound knowledge, I would say, in that area and has seen a lot. Um, so, and he hates me for saying that now, I think. <laughs> but ask him for other things that he really cares a lot about as well. Um, just one thing about the optics components, of course, it makes a difference if you have um, lens distortion if you try to do measurements. And um, some of you may have seen the Stania application for building staircases or um, there's a competitor product as well. And um, they, of course, use camera views to do measurements. Similarly, uh, our friends in this European Space Agency in a testing institute use cameras and lenses to do measurements. And if you have uh, kind of consumer-grade equipment and distortion, that's not a good thing. And if you ever need to walk down that aisle, then you probably want to uh, look for additional things that you can clip on or put on or integrate, you know, on a, even on a hardware level if you need to. Speakers. Um, is also another area that we won't talk much about, um, but you will have noticed in the experiences you already had on the smart glasses that 3D surround sound is quite amazing if you can hear somebody talk behind you. Um, we will maybe speak a little bit about haptic actuators and um, other sensors. Sensors to detect interaction and drive the user experience but also sensors that are put into the environment to work with, or machines. <coughs> On the software um, components and production tools side, I will speak a little bit about different types of tracking. Not so much about recognition, although that is something that we have in planning for the successor course of this one. Um, with object recognition, I mean detecting that this is a clicker, and this is a person, and um, that is a chair, that sort of thing. With object tracking, I mean knowing that this is now moving. Yeah. Interaction libraries, um, there's a lot of exciting stuff out there. Um, libraries that uh, you look at your hand and you can use your fingertips as a dial pad um, and, and many more special effect libraries that spice your augmented reality experience by <coughs> making it more glittery and glimmering. But we won't talk too much about those either. We will talk in this lecture a little bit still about the photogrammetry tools and animation tools. There are also um, something rather new around that I'm sure will keep us busy the next few years in research as well as in industry. There are about 20, 25 companies at the moment around the globe that are trying to bring 4D capture, 4D video or volumetric video uh, to the consumer for applications such as recording um, actors, people, your home environment in 4D, meaning a person moving over time or an environment um, over time um, for applications such as holoportals, uh, as uh, we have one at our project partner site in Ravensbourne, um, or <coughs> for a film production on, on a higher quality level, um, like in the Dimension Studios or in the Microsoft Studios. Yeah. Also something that we um, have kept for kind of master projects or for the successor course is hologram sharing and more interactive experiences across multiple devices and mixed devices as well, so that they're not only people wearing 
but also people um, carrying and, and so on. But as said, I will speak only briefly about um, some aspects of this and not too much about the others, although we can happily talk one of the evening, evenings or coffee breaks. Yeah, before I dive um, a bit deeper into um, the display systems, I thought I'll distract you briefly with some examples of haptics. That is a company around the corner in, I mean to say, Bristol. Uh, Ultra Haptics that uh, develops a yeah, ultrasound um, haptic display. So you have these little ultrasound emitters that you see here that create a rather low resolution um, haptic display where you can actually sense and feel. Um, and that allows to create quite different experiences because you have direct haptic feedback. Or something completely crazy um, that is uh, good fun to use. Um, in the meantime, also with industrial applications, uh, the Tesla suit, or um, there's a Russian equivalent as well um, of a, uh, a electromagnetic, uh, electromuscular stimulation EMS of a suit that you wear on your skin, and there are um, yeah, emitters that activate your muscles under the skin. Um, and I brought one example here that's from the Hasso Plattner Institute, uh, was published at the CHI conference, where you can see a quite funny example of what it means to have such electromuscular stimulation. So you see the person here is wearing some pads. On these pads there is low current. Um, so it's not invasive, although there is also invasive uh, EMS that's just on the skin. And it's, it's good enough to really make your muscles jerk. So you can actually feel that. You don't see it that much in the video, but if you try it out and you have somebody activate um, in the Tesla suit, for example, certain patterns, you really feel like, first time I tried that, it, the guy said that may tingle a little bit. and. Uh, pointed on his iPad on one of the muscle pads here, and it was like, oh, <laughs> hit in the guts. Um, quite funny if you then play a saloon shooter and you feel the impact of the bullets. Um, yeah, so applications are manifold. I'm not sure I would do that for many days and many hours of gaming. I'm not sure what it really does to the muscles. Um, but it is certainly on a level that um, it can be tried out and you can buy toolkits online to do something like that with, with school kids, so it can't be that bad, right? Yeah. Um, tracking is the other thing that I wanted to talk to you about. I'm sure you're all aware of the optical tracking technologies. We've all seen markers and we've all seen images that have been used instead of markers because they have distinct features and can be recognized in a similar way. You may also be aware of the possibility to use point clouds. Point clouds meaning uh, objects in 3D, uh, um, several different points that are distinct to a specific object or person, and hence can be used for recognizing where that person is at the moment and then doing something, or where that object is um, in the room and then doing something with the object. But there are other possibilities and they have been around for a while. Acoustical tracking, for example, you can use ultrasound again to emit sounds uh, from a light switch in the room, allowing for um, smart glasses navigation or, or similar tasks, uh, wayfinding. You can use electromagnetic tracking, um, mechanical tracking, where some wheels are operated that show where the experience currently must be. Um, you can use depth sensors for tracking. You can use a combination thereof. There are many other possibilities that you can use in, uh, to get the results that you want to achieve. And depending on your application, it may even be wiser not to go for optical tracking. Um, as optical tracking has issues like, for example, it doesn't work in a dark room. Um, that works then, however, with, with other sensors. Yeah. Display systems. 
Um, there are many different types of display systems around. We already saw that in my introduction. From the object to the eye, it um, scales. Um, we have projectors, spatial see-throughs, handheld displays, handheld projectors, head-mounted displays, retinal displays, and head-mounted projectors. And they all have their pros and cons and different working principles. So, for example, we have um, the see-through architecture, which is in principle the same for a handheld see-through as well as for a, a glasses see-through. So you have, um, for example, the rendering engine, which then buffers stuff and delivers it um, um, through plane, through the combiner, overlaid on the real world, um, using, if it's an optical see-through, a combination of virtual light beams coming from the display and real light beams reflected from the objects combined together. Um, as, as in this uh, diagram is shown. And there are quite a number of uh, producers out there that you will find. So here's just a selection of a few of them. Um, we can see at least the executive abstract of the smart glasses report online. Um, we have a few others here, like I think we have an M100 somewhere. We're not using that anymore, really. And the Google Glass, I'm not sure where it is. The Epson BT200 is standing somewhere in a showcase as old technology. Um, of the ones down here, th those are the ones that we have here. The ODG R9 is also pretty cool. Um, the Meta is also quite amazing, however, has the big disadvantage that it has to be tethered to a computer. So you have a long wire keeping you essentially restrained to where the next desktop PC is. And for our use cases, that's not the greatest. Um, on the class of the BT200, you find also the Athea 1, the Lumos DK40, although I, I of both would prefer the BT200 or BD350 um, by now. Yeah, and a few others that are similar to a Google Glass. The, um, we have Usix M100, the Aura X, and I think I have never tried the Recon Jet. Um, the last one is also similar, I mean to say. Yeah, so there's a lot out there. Those are only a few selected ones. There's a lot uh, moving in the field, and um, I'm hoping the smart glasses revolution is happening yesterday. Um, but it may still be <coughs> weeks, months, years, who knows. We're definitely very close to the next revolution in personal computing. The advantages of optical see-through AR is um, they're simpler. In particular, they seem to require less battery because they do not need to have a video feed. They do not need to light up the whole display. They do not need to render a complete uh, virtual reality or user interface. They just highlight those elements that are virtual over, superimposed over the real world view. Um, they offer the usual advantages of having a direct view of the real world. Um, and hence, they are safer. No risk of people stumbling over because of latency and a cable in the way. Uh, they typically also have lower distortion, and um, yeah, they do not have eye displacement. Uh, I already mentioned the video uh, AR architecture um, difference being um, that there is, instead of real light beams coming from the real objects, just a video feed, which works especially on some of the cheaper smart glasses very well. The ghost experience that we've seen in the introduction has been made that way. Um, it used the video see-through of the world, which was very intuitive, um, which worked particularly well as the camera uh, at that time of the smart glasses was not particularly great. Low frame rate, latency, everything lagging behind. And um, to be honest, if you look at uh, iPad applications, for example, for augmented reality, then they, uh, their visual quality is quite stunning. 
what they can do with uh, the video see-through is quite amazing. Yeah. Um, do you find also uh, special um, equipment for that? Um, like here, the Fusix Wrap. I'm not even sure that one is still produced, but there is surely a successor product. Yeah. The advantages of video see-through are you really see everything like it should be. So, for example, if you compare those two images here, sorry for the low resolution, um, this here is the optical see-through where the superimposed tower is a little bit transparent and it, of course, breaks the illusion a little bit. Whereas here in a um, video see-through, it is perfectly fitted into in the environment and you can't distinguish anymore whether that's real or not. So that's the, let's uh, bring it up and uh, say it clearly. This is what a film studio will use. This is um, what um, we will use in, in our augmented reality experiences, which makes, in my view, them a little bit more magic, but also cannot completely be taken for real. Yeah. So there are other advantages as well. I'm not going too much into detail. Yeah, the big difference, um, I think, is the costs. Um, video see-through is cheaper, a lot cheaper. Optical see-through is more difficult to achieve. It also requires um, more expensive um, hardware. And um, that way, the video see-through gets away with doing lower grade stuff, like the latency is not particularly great, and so is the accuracy. Yeah, then um, we already talked about it briefly, the iMultiplex um, architecture. Um, this here is an example shot through a Google Glass. This is what it looks like in real. So you have that pixel lighting up, um, superimposed in there. Um, if you combine registration with a camera, you can actually deliver augmented reality experiences in the room, but on a single eye um, with, since the arms are quite flexible and you can adjust the, cam uh, the, the cube the where you want to have it um, with very little stability of where things actually are. Um, you can, on devices like that, do it. It's just not fun. Yeah. You, that's a different alternative. Then there are other solutions like uh, projection-based augmented reality. Um, there is, for example, the possibility, uh, um, it's a rather different approach. You can uh, wear these movie glasses, you know, the ones with one eye red, one eye green and um, you can coat objects or surfaces with reflective coating that then um, throw back the um, images uh, in different way and the filters can pick it up on the eye so that you actually get a stereoscopic um, reflection delivered to your eyes and reconstruct an, uh, a 3D experience. Um, has the big advantage that the glasses that you need to wear for that are um, a lot cheaper and the expenses basically in the installation. Um, Protection-based they are without reflective coating, um, like here, um, a solution from a spin-out company out of VTT, Delta Sydney Labs, um, uses laser pointers. Um, so you can see here there is some indication of what needs to be done, um, or here registration marks where <laughs> drilling needs to happen. And that way, if you are able to install that fixed in a workplace, you can deliver um, projection onto the objects, seeing things where you need to see them. Um, or in, in the case of Delta Signal Labs, at the time they were developing a product that um, is a small box. So um, you can take a portable projector with you and it will figure out where things are and then do them. Projection-based AR can be very amazing. Um, Mark is doing um, light installations, I would say, um, in his secret life. 
touring with a band. Um, others are doing um, experiences like Le Petit Chef, which I wanted to share with you because it is really very amazing. So you see that it's using several beamers, which you not only use for the coverage, but also for the light. So if you use multiple beamers overlapping, then you get more light intensity. And um, that one is quite amazing. There are quite a number of artists that do things like that, um, creating installations for conferences. The people who made Le Petit Chef um, have also some others. I'm not sure I'm mixing them up with a different artist group, but there are also some that have a, a mobile bar where then a little barkeep pops out of a volcano and delivers your water to the um, coconut tree so it can grow then the coconut uh, milk that you require for your cocktail and so on and so on. Yeah. That would be uh, one of my favorite restaurants yeah, so that's a range of different delivery systems. They all have their pros and cons. Uh, I wouldn't kind of brush off any of them off the table in particular. Um, it really depends on what you need to do and also how much money you have for hardware. Um, there are hidden costs in maintenance and, and so on. That is uh, one technology with projection. The laser uh, ones are simpler, so they're monochrome, and they typically have somewhere inside very fast-moving um, laser beams. So they create that illusion, and you sometimes see it out on the street where bars and restaurants have this projection onto the pavement, or some of the cars have that as well. The new VWs have that when you open the door there's this projection on the floor or uh, the Mercedes have some warning sites for cyclists and pedestrians and there's some cycle projectors as well that you can mount onto your front wheel that put warning signs out to drivers like danger I'm, I'm coming through so the monochrome ones they work slightly differently and can be um, a, a real alternative. There are other projection-based solutions which can be interesting too, and that's in particular, I think, uh, the backlit projection. So if you have the space to actually project from the back of the room by separating some part out, and you can project on the full front, that um, is certainly cheaper than a lot of TFT displays side by side. Um, or if you don't have enough space, some of them just use a system of mirrors, so you kind of create the projection distance you need inside, and you can still fit it into a reasonable sized uh, room. But that's pretty much it about the projection technologies I know. Yeah, The thing that I really would like to know a lot more about is um, projecting onto moving objects, projection mapping um, and uh, tracking the objects and turning them into something that isn't there, um, visible from multiple angles maybe even. That would be quite amazing and is done if you look around and look at some cool Vimeo videos of the installations in the arts world. That is quite amazing. Yeah, we haven't spoken much about cars, but that's a completely different world. So in cars there are also different types of head-mounted displays that uh, project into the windscreen. Some of them um, are very sophisticated. Continental is developing some stuff that is uh, protruding slowly into the car manufacturing world where you project from the bottom, from the dashboard up in a kind of a light tunnel that is only visible to the driver. So everybody else does not have that experience, it's just the driver. And um, paired with some sensors pointing outwards, as you would need for some of the lower class self-driving cars that can park themselves or keep the lane, then it's uh, quite possible to project stuff really stereoscopically into the environment, like tur a turn left arrow on a road where you need to turn left, or um, highlighting some, some dangers. Reckless driver ahead, reckless driver ahead. Yeah. I wonder if the minis um, in the future no longer will display ghosts on their dashboard when there is a ghost driver coming down the wrong side, 
off the lane, but in the future you have real ghosts out there. No, that would be scary. Who would do that? Really, seriously, who would do that? Sensors. Um, a few more minutes that we have on sensors. There are many different types of sensors around. Just to give you a crazy example from a few years ago, um, this year was a fun project at Mitayo back in 2014 where I believe it was a PhD student found a thermal camera that nobody was really using and started playing around with it and discovered that you can actually use that thermal camera for interaction. So when you, where's the example, um, put your hand onto the bonnet of that model car and then remove it, it still leaves that yellow imprint for a few seconds until the heat signature fades away. And you can pick that up and do something with it. So in, in that example here, um, you could turn on the lights of the car by touching the bonnet. And um, <laughs> yeah, there are certainly some possibilities of um, doing interesting things with rather unconventional sensors as well. What I, however, strongly wanted to recommend um, is to take a look at Arduino and build your own sensors. So if you discover that you have the perfect delivery system, but the sort of experience that you would like to have is just a bit beyond its capabilities, for example, because it can't see your fingers behind the back or funny things like that, then your choice is to build your own interaction device. So um, Arduino, um, probably you all heard of it, are these computers that um, came out of a project in Italy. Um, I think they have been around for a long time. When I was in secondary school, we basically had these big PCs with which we would do the same thing, like lay some wires out through the printer cable to make some blinking lights. Um, today the same computer fits into yeah, the size of uh, two, two two pound coins side by side and even smaller if you get rid of that little display and um, the sensors you might want to work with are equally small so here on the right is a motion sensor in the middle is a buzzer that's an actuator rather than a sensor and um, there on the bottom you would find a heart rate sensor that you can put your little finger in to measure um, how high your pulse is or clip something onto your earlobe to do a measurement. These things are really um, kind of electronics 101 level that you can do with primary school children and uh, people do do that with primary school children, especially the stuff around wearables. That's uh, quite a common place in, in Oxford and I'm sure around the globe to teach to secondary school children, beginning of secondary school, how to make a t-shirt with some blinking lights, how to uh, knit a loudspeaker or other exciting things. And um, it is something that uh, you should seriously consider if you want to innovate some cool products. And I brought only one example to show you um, what four wires and two of these sensors and a bit of standard code do that you can get off the internet. And that here is basically controlling, that's not even Unity, that's um, whatever environment, controlling with an IMU, an inertia measurement unit, meaning motion sensor, um, the cube here on the screen. Yeah, there are different types of sensors. Some of them work better, some of them work less good. Um, the, in the end effect, it's the price that tells you which one you need. They range from t five pounds to 30 pounds roundabout. And similarly, these components that we see here, the other ones, I think that's probably 50p or a pound. That here is probably uh, I think the last ones I bought for eight or nine dollars um, somewhere on AliExpress. Yeah. Plus a bit of LED uh, and plus a bit of cable. One of the things that we uh, will try out here 
is an off-the-shelf sensor. Some of you have seen it already. It's uh, the Structure.io 3D scanner. It's an iPad clip-on. Um, costs not a lot. I mean to say it's something like 300 pounds. Plus the scanning application. In that case, we use Itzy's 3D. And um, that allows us, with a bit of practice, to create on a home device rather good 3D scans of person or objects that uh, we can work with them. So during one of our tutorials, we will look a little bit into animating them and bringing, bringing your body back up to life again. Good. Yeah, I think that was enough for me for a technology overview and a big merry-go-round about. Um, so thank you here. And of course, as always, I'm open for further questions now or later. Thank you.